Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Deb Wallace. I'm the Executive Director of Knowledge and Library Services here at Harvard Business School. And I'm just delighted that you're joining us for our third uh, Books at Baker studio session. Uh, when we started the Books at Baker series about four years ago, it, we started in a, an Aldridge classroom here on campus. And then with the uh, pandemic and everyone moving to virtual, we moved online as well. Uh, but what we found is these sessions are so um, in demand and our, our, we have so many faculty with fabulous research to report on that we decided to do a second series uh, of books at Baker called the studio session where we make these recordings. And I'm just delighted to have Sandra Sutcher join us to talk about her new book, uh, The Power of Trust. So the new book, it's here and everybody, um, let's see, I have to go this way. Um, I've got an advanced copy and I, it really is literally off hot off the press. I thought I was going to have to talk from this, the, the PDF, but in fact, uh, here we are with your book. So Sandra has uh, been at the B School um, going on 20 plus years. Uh, she is a beloved teacher of a number of incredible uh, courses, The Moral Leader, which, you know, reminds me of the, the great book series. I some I just want to read through the, the syllabus and join um, how you, you uh, develop people thinking about their moral compass and uh, the leadership and corporate accounting courses. But in fact, she has been studying trust from a variety of perspectives ever since you started your career in retail uh, at, with Filene's uh, and Fidelity, and then coming here to the B-School. So we're so delighted uh, to have you join us, bringing all of these areas together to talk about a really, really important part of business that is very difficult to make concrete. So uh, in conjunction with your co-author, uh, who's also a research associate here at um, Harvard Business School, uh, Shaleen Gupta, we're just delighted to learn more. So let me start with, uh, you note that when trust is in the room, a world of potential is unlocked. And when it's not in the room, things fall apart. So can you start by helping us break down this component? Like what is trust? How do, how do we know what it is? So, uh, Deb, thank you so much. Uh, I am thrilled to be here uh, writing a book. I remember meeting someone at a conference and, and she said she just published a book and she said it took her 10 years. I asked her how long it would take. And I thought, 10 years? That's crazy. Uh, <laughs> and then I realized I've been at this for like all the, literally just about the 20 years I've been at HBS. So I can't believe the book is out. So, so the, let me start uh, just by uh, helping understand, helping you understand uh, how trust works. Because uh, when we studied this, what we found were that there are a whole series of myths about trust uh, that turn out not to be true. Uh, so, so here, uh, pandemic mode, we're thinking about how trust works. Uh, and the first thing is that trust is a relationship. So uh, it's not ether, it's not the glue that holds us all together. Uh, trust is a relationship, uh, it's specific and limited. And what we mean by that is that uh, there's the person who is trusting, that would be the guy uh, who's getting his vaccination. Uh, there's the person who he's trusting or organization, in this case, the woman who's giving the vaccination. And then there's the thing that he's trusting about. Right, and so in this case, he's trusting that this is a vaccine, she's got the right one, it's gonna go in his arm and nothing bad will happen to him. Uh, but that's all that the trust is in this moment. So instead of thinking of trust as this global thing, all or nothing, I trust you or I don't, uh, it really is quite specific and that's helpful because it means you can start to get your arms around it. Uh, and the fact that it's a relationship, we know about relationships. Right, we right. Manage relationships all the time. Uh, another thing is that trust is very much in the eye of the beholder. So we, I used to think that everyone trusted for the same reasons, that there was some objective standard against which we were trusting. And it turns out uh, not so much, that it really is. Each person has their own reasons for trusting. Uh, and so if you're trying to manage trust, what you're managing is the perspective of each individual and whether or not they're willing to trust you or your organization at a particular moment to do a certain thing. Uh, the other thing is that trust is a power relationship, 
right? So this guy is trusting uh, that the person who's giving him the shot, uh, that person has power over them right then. Uh, and so it's very much a relationship of vulnerability uh, to other people's actions. Uh, is she going to do the right thing and their intentions? Mm -hmm. You know, why is she doing what she's doing? How is she thinking about that? Uh, and then when you switch the lens and think about it from her standpoint, uh, one of the things that struck us in all the case studies that we've written about this is that trust is built from the inside out. So if this woman is going to be doing a good job every day coming to this site to help do vaccinations, she's doing that because of how she's being treated. Uh, and it's pretty ah. difficult in an organization to have people create these relationships of trust if they themselves don't feel trusted in the relationship that they're in. So that's some headlines around how trust works. Uh, and now let's turn then to what we did with our research in particular. Yeah, the, frame, the framework that you put together is really the frame for the book too, isn't it? The, the, these, these four components. Exactly. So what we did is a lot of, you know, case-based research, inductive research, kind of going into companies and trying to look at examples where things worked, where they didn't. And out of that, we said, okay, what, what seems to be going on here? Why do people trust? Mm -hmm. uh, and what we ended up understanding is that there are four elements on the basis of which we trust. Uh, the first is just is the organization or the individual competent. Uh, and this is the foundation of trust. So if you look at that picture we just saw, we're trusting in the competence of the woman who's administering that vaccine, uh, that this is gonna go right, and the organization behind her to line up all the things that need to happen in order for that guy to show up at a certain point of time, to be ready, to be treated well, and all of that. Uh, the second thing though, is if, if competence were all that mattered uh, in trust, we'd all trust Uber. Right, we feel great about using Uber. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but trust, then, you know, we then trust on some additional dimensions. Uh, we care, as it turns out, about uh, uh, organizations' motives, about why they do what they do. Uh, and so, because we can't get inside the head of an organization, we can see whose interests they serve. Mm -hmm. So this is at the back of a lot of conversation about: is a corporation only in business to satisfy the needs of its shareholders? Uh, or does it take into account the interests of other people, its customers, its employees, the general public? So we're going to judge whether that organization is trustworthy based on whose interests we see it serving. The next dimension is how the organization does what it does. So I don't just care about why they're doing what they're doing, whether they're competent. I care about how they do it. And, and basically what I'm asking about is this organization going to be fair in how it deals with me? Uh, and so fairness here, for example, going back to uh, the picture we just saw would be if the manufacturer of the vaccine knows that there's a side effect, that they are transparent mm -hmm. uh, with me to let me know what to expect when I get my vaccination. Uh, and if they're not, uh, that's being unfair to me. They're withholding information. And so we care a lot about the how business gets mm -hmm. done. Uh, and then the last thing, and this was, I, I would say, if there's a contribution that we make uh, to the literature here is to pull out the importance of impact. So in all the books that I read uh, mm -hmm. in trust, all the prior literature, people really didn't make very much of the fact that we judge on the basis of the real concrete, I can see it with my own eyes, impacts of actions. So much is made about the purpose-driven corporation, which I'm a huge supporter of. Mm -hmm. uh, but in addition to purpose, there's impact, yeah. right? There's what is the effect of what you're doing? Uh, and here, the trust question uh, is, the, does the organization take responsibility for intended impacts and for unintended impacts? Right. right. So if, if we take, take this frame and uh, the comment before about when it's in the room and when it's not, do you have um, from your research some favorite favorite examples or ones that you, that you think are um, help us understand this in more concrete terms of when it's in the room and when it's not? Uh, yeah, so, so let me start when it's not uh, and get back to Uber uh, just for a minute because Uber is kind of the test case uh, for understanding why trust is more than just competence. Mm -hmm. 
So Uber took the market by storm, created ride hailing as we know it, by getting us from point A to point B cheaper, faster, and better than we could do in almost any other way. Uh, and then we started learning things about how Uber did business that gave many people pause about whether or not they wanted to do business with Uber. Uh, so with respect to motives, here's a story. In 2013, an Uber driver ran into a family in San Francisco uh, killing their six-year-old daughter and injuring her mother and brother. So the family sued and Uber argued at the time of the accident that the driver was not an Uber employee uh, because he didn't have a passenger in his car uh, and he hadn't yet accepted his next ride. So what are whose interests are Uber protecting? Certainly not the driver who works for them and especially not the people whose lives they've just changed for the worse. Uh, when it comes to means, uh, there is a story about the fact that for an entire year from 2013 to 2015, the months within that, uh, Uber used its own drivers uh, to book and then cancel 5,000 rides with Lyft. And they did this to try to mess up the operations because right. this is a business on which showing up on time, being there is everything. Uh, so we would call that unfair, unfair mm -hmm. competition. Yeah. So from a mean standpoint, this is not a company that you're going to want to rely on. No. Uh, and finally, in terms of impact, I don't know if you recall in 2017, there was this amazing blog post that was written by a woman named Susan Fowler. So Susan Fowler was a reliability engineer uh, and she published a whistleblowing blog post about what it was like uh, to be a woman and sexual harassment at Uber. Yeah. So here's the impact of that. Uh, in the division where she worked, when she joined, women were 25% of the population that was there. When mm -hmm. she left in just two years, they were 6%. Oh, really? So Uber didn't wow. intend to decimate the ranks of the capable women who were there, uh, but it created an impact uh, through an environment uh, that meant that this is a toxic place to work if you're a female engineer, and so you take to the hills. So, you know, if you believe that there's a God and that there is justice uh, in the world, it turns out that betraying trust is not like a good idea. Yeah. So, so Uber... Uh, sort of dominates the market. And then by 2021, Lyft actually has 32% share of market. Mm -hmm. So they come out of nowhere right. to take a third of the market. Uh, and Uber has started losing court cases uh, about this notion that the drivers who work for it are not employees. Right. Right. Uh, so the UK has actually said, no, 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 <laughs> guess what? They are employees. You have to give them a minimum wage and you have to give them vacation. So, so this is an example of how not to be trustworthy. Uh, and you can see how competence, motives, means, and impacts show up. Uh, so now, Deb, I've got another story about what it looks like in a positive sense. Sure. Yeah, let's do that too. Yeah. Okay. So, th so this, is, this is a great story. Uh, so you may remember Nokia, right? All right. Yeah, Nokia used to be a business that we knew a lot about in the phone world. Uh, and then they started being outcompeted in a serious way in 20, 2010, 2011. Uh, and they, the leadership knew that they had to do a major layoff restructuring. Uh, and it was going to be so big, it ended up being 18,000 employees wow. yeah. uh, at the company. Uh, and they had had a really terrible experience with a bad layoff that they had in Germany. Uh, and they basically said, you know what, we're not going to do it like that. We're going to try to find a different way to do a layoff because they wanted to make a bet. Uh, and the bet was that if we can create a program that makes you feel that you'll be supported by us while we manage this restructuring, you will stay on the job if we help you get a new job at the end of this. Right. So this is a bet on fairness. Right, and they said we think that this would be a better way to go because we definitely need these people, uh, and we and so what they set up was this amazing. So the competence story here uh, is they created a new way of doing layoffs, uh, and they said our job is to give you a safe landing uh, to find a new place. There were five paths that they opened up to help you get a new job. They'd help you get a job inside Nokia, outside Nokia. They give you money to start a new business. 
they would pay for additional education, uh, or they offered money if you could think of something that was a fifth path that they hadn't anticipated uh, they would do. They put the mechanism for all of this to occur in place in 13 countries, oh uh, led by local managers who themselves were going to be losing their jobs. So with respect to motives, uh, it was very clear that here they were going to defend the interest of the employee. And in fact, they asked the board for permission to run these programs because they said, we're going to do something that's so different. We're going to be so transparent and we're going to prioritize the interests of employees mm -hmm. ahead of our interest at the moment. And we're not going to go forward with this if you don't buy into this. The board gave them permission. Uh, and so basically, and boards can do that at this motives level say, here's whose interests matter, and we're going to help you do that. Uh, when it came to fair means, you know, they told them all about this. Uh, they gave people, you know, full notice about when their jobs would end. Uh, and they supported them in this process of being able to choose which of these paths, that's procedural fairness, I get a stake in my own future by deciding which of these paths I want to follow. And then the impact was pretty amazing. So 60% of 18,000 employees across 13 countries knew their next step the day they left the firm. Incredible. Yeah, I've studied layoffs for a decade uh, and I've never seen anything like this with results uh, that is so positive in respect to supporting employees in their next step. Uh, the company benefited too, quality levels maintained the same. Mm -hmm. And the company had the same percent of revenues from new products that were developed during the restructuring as they did from the periods before. A third of their revenues came in from new products that were created under these conditions. Uh, and for the skeptics in the crowd, I was among them who said, well, they must have given away the store. This must have been hugely expensive. Uh, it turns out that the cost was less than 4% of what they paid for restructuring. So it does not take a huge amount of money. What you can see here is that there's an innovative aspect to being trustworthy uh, that actually is more than let's just be a good player and do things as we said we would. Uh, it's like really creating new ways to be trusted. Uh, and this is a great example of that. Well, in, in fact, you know, you're know, you mentioning Nokia and uh, the layoffs. Uh, that's how I first met you. You were you were starting to amass a whole literature uh, around layoffs. We looked at, oh, is there an information product that we could develop for you to organize all of this? And then I had to lay off um, someone. And it was, it, I had not done that at HBS. I'd done it in other jobs. And so I turned to you and I said, Sandra, can you help me think through this? And this is one of the beauties of working at HBS is when it's, it's like a learning laboratory all around us that we can um, check in with expertise. And so you, you helped me immeasurably and hopefully the, the it, of course, we didn't measure it in the same uh, way that Nokia did, but I, I think it worked out um, fairly well. But so, in fact, you were studying um, a different aspect of trust, you know, really focused on, on layoffs. And here you are now looking at a, a much bigger picture. So it's this, as you were saying, 20-year uh, uh, journey. Can you tell us a little bit about that that journey? How, how did you end up here uh, so at this point? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll skip the I was born at an early age. <laughs> After one, I am born, right? Yes. Right. right. Uh, I will say, though, that uh, part of how I ended up doing this work uh, is that I was I was born in Detroit. Yeah. I went to schools that were half black and half Jewish. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know people, Deb, who looked like you until I went to college. There were four natural blondes in a graduating class of seven. Thank you for the natural blonde. I'll take that. Seven hundred <laughs> Nordic background in my high school. So I was always uh, kind of a fellow traveler in issues around DEI, uh, right. racial justice. This was just part of how I grew up. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up at the time of Vietnam War protests and so social justice and the basis on which. So, so all of that came with me as it always does. We bring our past with us. Right. 
uh, into, into business uh, where I continued to do things related to some of these ideas. I started a women's group when I was at Filene's uh, for senior women to get together and talk and just talk about how we could make progress uh, among ourselves. When I was at Fidelity, I remember having to uh, establish a process. And so the junior women at that point came to the senior women, us, and said, we want to start wearing pants to work. Oh. But the men don't think this is a good idea. So what do you think? And so we said, well, guess what? We'll start first. We'll create an umbrella, a cover for you to socialize uh, this new way of looking at work. Uh, and then you just come in underneath the umbrella we sail. Uh, and and so, so I've always been kind of a, someone who's tried to make a difference uh, in these areas. And so when I got to HBS, there was this wonderful little program called Leadership Values and Decision Making. Mm -hmm. So this used to, this was nine sessions given before the MBA program started. Uh, there the theory was dip them in ethics first, and that will then help them throughout uh, their two years that they there. We, I think, have now thought differently about how to think about those, that process. Uh, but that opened up the notion that there were two basic domains that I was interested in. One of them was how do people make ethical decisions? Right, how do leaders lead in a way that's ethical? And so I was really fortunate uh, to be asked to teach the moral leader this course where we develop, we use literature uh, to help students develop their own practical definition of what an act of moral leadership looks like to them. Uh, and then I was also part of the group that started the leadership and corporate accountability course. Yeah. And that gave me a chance to pursue this interest around how organizations can do the right thing. Uh, and then, quite honestly, I was fortunate to meet Shalene, my research associate and co-author, uh, who, when we were on a research trip, uh, said to me, because at the time I was in train to write a book about layoffs, I'd finished the book, actually, uh, and she said, do you really, really, she said nicely, she, we only knew each other for six months, do you really want to write a book, a book about layoffs? I think your research is about something that's bigger than that. So it took me about a nanosecond, one, to admire her courage, two, to think about what she said. This was a moment of trust. Uh, and then to just kind of say, you know, she's right. You know, these layoffs, that's a, that's a part of a bigger thing. DEI is important unto itself, but it's part of a bigger terrain. And that's when we started looking at all the cases I developed, all the work I'd done uh, through the lens of trust. And what does it take for an organization to be trusted? And what does it take for an individual leader to be trusted? So that's the kind of backstory about how all this ended up getting woven together. Well, and I, I recall in the very introduction of the book, you're talking about sitting in the lobby of the, the hotel in, in Tokyo and Shaleen coming up to you. And I thought, you know, I worked with you, love working with you, but I would have to really think twice about saying, you know, Sandra, I'm not sure that that's really like, should we think of? So I, that that moment is, uh, and then Shalene talks about it too, and saying like, what was it like from her perspective of saying, oh, here's an HBS professor, someone I've just started working with. Um, but so your whole work um, program has been um, relied on trust. But I also think, you know, the whole case method, the research that you do, relies heavily on trust, like a, a company opening up their books, opening up their, their um, showing warts and all of what's going well and not, you know, oftentimes the problems, what's not going well. How, how does that trust cycle work with, uh, with your research? So, so there are kind of two moments to focus on when you're writing a case. The first is in the beginning, right? So originating trust. Sure. How can you build, have the other party build trust in you? And HBS has a very fair process. So companies have to sign off on the cases that we write. Uh, we normally, we always give individuals a chance to sign off on their quotes before they're shown to senior leaders. 
just so that if people feel like, well, now, now on reflection, imagining other people reading this, you right. know, I may want to sort of dis, dis, word that a little bit differently. Yeah. Uh, and all of this is very transparent. So we have good processes, I think, to help us establish trust, NDAs to protect information, uh, and make sure we don't spill the beans uh, in some way that's totally in, a, in any way inappropriate. Uh, and then the second part of trust is how do you maintain trust? Because cases take a long time to write. Uh, and here you actually quite often, I've found in my career, have to move into a moment of trust recovery. So I've oh. had several cases where we thought we had the right framing, we thought the right dilemma was identified, we told the story as we understood it, and it goes up to the CEO uh, who said in a couple of cases, well, that's not how I remembered this. Oh. And so, you know, if you care about the content and you want to get the case out, then you have to sort of step back and say, okay, what's wrong with what we did? How did we get to the point where we did? So this is part of trust recovery. Right. Uh, and the offer of repair uh, is just, okay, we're going to rewrite this case once we have a solid agreement about what are the things that you think are problematic in the way that we framed it. So I, so, so, so it's not just sort of one and done, you yeah. know, at the beginning, yeah. it's really a process as you unfold in the case writing where there are times where you just, you have your view, uh, but the person who you need to satisfy, and I don't mean in the standpoint of uh, censoring what we're doing, sure. it's for what view of reality are you representing, right? And there you really are telling a company story. And so it at least has to ring true to the people who were part of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so there's this recovery aspect as well. Yeah. So this whole process is very similar to uh, trusting a company outright as, a, as a, a consumer, is that you have to gain it, you have to maintain it. If you lose it, then you have to regain it. So the same process in your, in your, your research. That was yeah. fascinating. So, but let's go back to the, the, um, the, your opening slide with the pandemic, uh, the getting the inoculation. I thought that it was just such a, a perfect illustration about these many, many aspects of trust. And, and probably the one, at least the one that we're dealing with now, as I think many other people are as well, is the trust of the employees to move forward is that now, um, especially well in Massachusetts, in just a couple of days, the state of emergency is going to be lifted. Um, the university, Harvard University, has talked about everybody um, we're getting back in mode for the fall. And uh, the summertime is a time to uh, get reacquainted with uh, work in new ways, what this new normal might look like. And throughout the book, you, you do highlight um, this regaining trust or rethinking uh, work. Can you talk to us a little bit about how the COVID um, experience, the pandemic experience has put a real spotlight on trust in so many different ways? So I'll, I'll say a, a few things. The first is that uh, COVID put a new requirement uh, into the employer. And this new requirement is that you have to have a safe environment for your employees right. and you actually have to care about their well-being. So it used to be that unless you were in mining or heavy manufacturing, safety did not feature largely mm -hmm. uh, in the way that you thought about what does it mean to be a good employer? What does it mean to be trusted as a good employer? So we now have this new yardstick that's going to be applied across all work venues, mm -hmm. uh, both on the standpoint of employees and the people who engage with that institution. So that's the first change. And I think that change is what I said, I call it semi-permanent, <laughs> meaning I, I can't imagine an environment in which that shifts, but that just I can see yeah. into the future. Uh, the second thing I'd say is that I, I think uh, if I were uh, in charge, I, I would look at this as a moment for trust recovery. And I mean that I don't think that we can just march forward as if the last 12 months has not occurred. Uh, and so I've been thinking a lot about what I, you know, would, what advice I would give. And I think the first thing is that the senior leadership has got to say, uh, we're sorry for the fact that this was such a tough time mm -hmm. for you. Uh, and they need to, to, they have to give an explanation about why they made the calls that they did. You know, wow. here are the tough choices that we made, mm -hmm. here's what we considered, here's how we came out where we did, here's whose interests we were looking after. Uh, and I think they need to sort of recover trust by explaining why they did what they did uh, over the last 12 months. 
Uh, and then I think we need this offer of repair. I think here we need to get much more granular and understand what employees need from us mm -hmm. in a new work environment. And so uh, I think if I were a direct manager of a group of any size, I'd, I'd want to meet with each individual and ask them three questions. Uh, the first would be, uh, how has COVID been for you? What has your life been like right. during the pandemic? I want to understand the experience that people are bringing with them back to work. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing I'd ask is what grade do you give us as an organization or me as a manager for how well we've managed the situation? What did we do that worked? What did we do that didn't work in your view? Just to understand again, that individual's perspective. Remember I did trust is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, and then the third thing I'd ask is what's the most important thing that we could do uh, to help you manage the biggest challenge you have in coming back to work. And I'm asking, this is what's called sort of interpersonal fairness, meaning I'm trying to get it down to the absolute individual level uh, because I worry that we're spending too much time at, on albeit important survey processes kind of at the global level and not enough time understanding one by each what each individual uh, has experienced and what they need from us going forward. So I would want a better base of data to work with mm -hmm. uh, and to, to build an action plan around. Uh, if I were thinking organizationally, I'd require those to be bubbled up so that people could start to get understand what different organizations, pieces the organization are facing and what might be common challenges. But I think the trick here is to kind of knit the organization back together by reestablishing a trusting relationship between the individual and his or her manager. And, you know, it, it just dawns on me um, thinking about some of Sadal Neely's work on the remote revolution. We, we did a session with her a little while ago, and she was talking about the need to relaunch and reset and constantly come back. So I'm wondering, what do you think about these three questions is, um, you know, just at the beginning, do you, is there a checking that that's part of the maintenance? Is there yeah, so any good process is going to have a feedback loop where at some point I come back to you and I say, Sandra, you and I talked six months ago, you, mm -hmm. you know, I just want to find out how are things going, you know, how are we working on that challenge, you know, what's come up that's different. Uh, so I think that that's right. I think coming back in, but I, I, and I, I think though that what's important is the accountability at the individual manager level. Because I, th I think that that's been sort of the missing link in a lot of what's happened during COVID. A lot of the emphasis in the organization has been at the very top, what are the policies? And then at the sort of everybody else level, which is how does this affect us? And we need to sort of reestablish the organization in its piece parts uh, in order to have it really have trust in the different people and organization pieces, the organization that exist. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that leads me to, uh, I, I think when we were talking earlier about the book, um, when you look at the multiple expectations, the, the stakeholder expectations that a leader at any level has to manage. And uh, we talked about the, the, the economic, the legal and the ethical. And then you've put in this chart that shows all of the various stakeholders and, and CrossFit and it's like the, the complexity of managing trust is, it, it, it's daunting. So uh, can we talk about this balancing act of you've got competing um, expectations, you've got competing priorities. Um, I guess I, I wonder how does an organization like Nokia actually get it right? Right. So, so let me uh, to change gears and talk about a different a story about a different organization. So this is Honeywell. Uh, okay, so uh, so Honeywell going into the Great Recession, uh, like any other major global manufacturer, uh, mm -hmm. had to figure out what stance it was going to take about layoffs, furloughs, how it was that they were going to manage the decline in demand uh, that they were facing. Uh, and, uh, and Dave Cote uh, had led a turnaround of Honeywell starting in 2002 uh, because Honeywell had been a mess when he came in. There were three parts of the organization, Allied Signal, Pitway, a company no one's ever heard of, and Honeywell, and he needed to knit them all back together. Mm -hmm. So he did this, he was on a good path, and then the recession comes. And he starts to think about, well, how are they going to approach this 
Uh, and what he ended up deciding was he was going to use furloughs uh, rather than layoffs. So he was the only global manufacturing based in the United States uh, who used furloughs. And his logic was twofold. One is he'd lived through two layoffs, major ones, when he was a GE as a senior leader. And he saw the internal damage that they created. And he said, there's got to be a way that leaves the organization in better shape at the end of this uh, for when the recession ends. Uh, and the other was just he thought that for their business, that certain parts of their business were doing sort of okay, others not so much. And he wanted something that was less global as an approach and that could be more tailored to individual organizations. And, and so what he did was uh, he ended up deciding that they were going to use furloughs. And that means in the United States, an unpaid leave of a certain period of time with uh, access to some unemployment benefits. Uh, and then in the rest of the world, there's more income sharing uh, that goes on. Uh, and, and he did this understanding that the priority he was setting was on the customer. Mm -hmm. He said, if we're going to have a sustainable business at the end of this, the one thing we have to guarantee during the recession is that we take care of our customers. And in order to do that, we need a well-functioning organization. We can still make good on the products that we promised them, any commitment that we've made. We have to do those things, even though it's a recession. And then within that, he said, okay, I know that I'm then going to be working with two groups who kind of disagree a little bit with what I'm doing. So the shareholders would have preferred, and he knew this, that he'd do a layoff. Let's take the hit. Let's really uh, have the supposed benefit of the cost reduction that comes with layoffs uh, in, in order to offset our declining demand and revenues. Uh, and he said that he didn't want to do that because he thought that that wouldn't actually give them a good sustainable organization at the end of the recession. Oh, okay. The employees, on the other hand, would just as soon have him forget about profits, forget the shareholder, right? Why should we care about shareholders when business is going down? And he wasn't willing to go down that path either. So for them, it was furloughs, you know, between one and five weeks. And he was the first to admit that that was a real hardship for people who lived paycheck to paycheck, but way better than losing your job for them and for the company. Uh, and for the shareholders that they ended up keeping more people on board, but he thought that the bet was worth it, that they were going to do a better recovery than other companies. Uh, and so it turned out that that was true. Uh, they had an amazing recovery. They were, their three-year stock returns, total stock returns between 2009 and 2012 were 20 points ahead of GE, who was their nearest competitor. So that's huge in terms of market support for the strategy that they did. Uh, and he also found that the company, they had less what they called regrettable turnover, meaning voluntary turnover after the recession. So usually what happens is if you survived a recession at the first sign of business picking up, you don't like what your company's done, you head for the hills. Sure. Right, and that's what's going on now, by the way, in terms of this labor shortage that we're seeing uh, and a lot of turnover. And so they saw none of that uh, in their organization. And so, so, you know, philosophers would call this a, a challenge of balancing right versus right. Yeah. So it's not that the employees, you know, so this is a challenge where you have equal moral grounds. Employees, it's fair for them to want to keep their jobs. Uh, in as full a way as they can. Shareholders, it's fair for them to want returns. Mm -hmm. Both of those are moral goods. There's nothing wrong with either of them. So this is not right versus wrong. Yeah. This is a question of needing to balance competing interests and do as much as you can for both of them uh, while understanding that you're not going to do either. Uh, the other thing that you do in the face of one of these right versus right challenges, you also prioritize. And so here he said customers on top. Anything um, else that I do, I'm going to say that of all the rank ordering of all those people you saw on that chart, yeah. I'm going to customers and their needs first, and then I'm going to be balancing these interests of shareholders uh, and my employees. So that's what it looks like in practice. Uh, and again, this notion that trust is limited is really important. So this was point in time managed through a recession uh, and trust works like that. It doesn't work in general. It's gonna come up in particular moments and places and domains in your organization. And those are the places where you work on it. It's not something that you're gonna work on everything all the time. Yeah.
Well, it, it's, it's a fascinating matrix to, to have a look at and think about how you might do that balancing act. I just, it, it's, it, it's just such a, a powerful uh, statement about the complexity of this work and the importance um, of it. But, but I, was, I was looking, uh, when I was looking at your um, biography or your profile on uh, the HBS um, research site, it said you've written over 110 cases, technical notes, teaching notes, and now this is your third book. Um, a number of your articles, 2018 article in uh, Harvard Business Review on layoffs that don't break your company was selected as a must read in your 2019 article on trust was um, feature work on trust was featured by HBR as uh, a big idea. And now you have this major work. And on top of that, um, you're advising the Edelman Trust Barometer and working with Deloitte on a trust dashboard so that we can, um, again, make this more concrete so that people can wrap their minds and their arms around it. So what's next for you? Where, where are you going uh, with this work? And uh, what's the sequel going to be? <laughs> Actually, from hearing your description, I think the sequel should be a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but instead, I will give the, the more expected response, uh, which is, uh, oh, yeah. so yeah, so, uh, so, so there are two things that I now uh, want to work on next. Uh, the first is just uh, measurement and implementation of trust. So now we've kind of mapped the world. Uh, we understand what trust is. We know how it operates. Now companies are going to start wanting to do something about it. Uh, and so this is the next phase, you know, which is, and that's why my collaborations are with several organizations that are working on how do you measure trust? Because you can't improve anything you don't have a baseline for. Yeah, yeah. And stuff. Uh, and then it's really trying to do some work, again, with some of these research partners uh, to look at companies that are trying to improve trusting relationships with stakeholders in particular domains. Mm -hmm. and just see what kinds of activities do they do What's it like to try to actually proactively go after improving trust and not just always be on the, re the back foot uh, trying to respond to a trust problem? So that's, that's the first uh, area. Uh, the other is the role of corporate boards in building and maintaining oh. trust. So we just did publish an article through hbr.org uh, about the Boeing board and lessons that you could learn from it. Uh, about the awful, awful Boeing debacle and the, the crashes of yeah. the two 737 uh, MAX jets. Uh, and it turns out that boards have a really important role to play mm -hmm. in this trust arena because yeah. boards are the linchpin uh, in the organization between the organization on the inside uh, right. and all the interested parties on the outside. So the, the board is supposed to be loyal, not to any given management team, uh, but to the institution as a whole. Uh, and so it's going to be very interesting to see, and lots of these issues are now bubbling up to the board level, DEI, ESG measurement reporting, all of these things, political stance, uh, these are now becoming board issues. And so I'm trying to start some research around what does this look like at the board level and how can people be measuring this, thinking about it? How can they build an environment in which these kinds of things, which have not normally been on the plate to talk about, uh, actually become part of the conversation for boards? Uh, I don't think you're going to get that vacation in, my dear. <laughs> that's, gonna, that's, that's a tall order. But you know, you you end the book by saying trust can't be claimed; it is judged by others, and they take a three hundred and sixty degree view. And it, it's just clear to me that you and Shaleen have created um, something for all of us to take a three hundred and sixty view. Of. It's an incredible uh, piece of work that will make trust concrete and actionable, which I think is so important for all of us to. Take the, uh, take the lessons learned uh, from your research. So I can't thank you enough for sharing um, this incredible book with us. I'll hold it up again once more. And <laughs> don't forget, it's going to come out without this on it. So uh, we wish you all the best. It launches on July 6th. 6th. So just around the corner, little, uh, just a little less than a month. That's so, so exciting. So thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to hearing the impact uh, the book does have. Um, if you want to read some more about Sandra and her work, there are many different links uh, available through Baker Library. 
through uh, HBS, and the book has its own uh, website as well. So that will be a fascinating um, source for people to uh, continue to uh, have a look at. So, any last words for us, Sandra, that you want to end? I I think the only last word is a request. So on the in the website the book website, uh, we have a form that's called Join the Trust Conversation. Oh, okay. uh, and where we're asking people to send us any thoughts that they have about trust challenges they've experienced, their reaction to what's in the book, oh, okay. stories they feel like we should be following up. Uh, and so for people who, you know, I obviously would love for people to buy the book, but I'm very interested in people's thoughts sure. about this whole domain. Yes. So if they could fill out one of those forms, hey, I'd be really that's happy. Great, That's great. Well. Well, thank you again, and we'll look forward to um, seeing the next edition. Great. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.